Good morning. It's good to see you. Let's stand. Let's join together in worship. We won't fear the battle. We won't fear the battle. We won't fear the night. We will walk the valley with you by our side. You will go before us, you will lead the way. We have found a refuge, only you can say. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? I stumble even when I fall even when I turn back still your love is sure you will not abandon you will not forsake you will cheer me onward with never-ending grace sing with joy now our God is for us the Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress raise your voice now greater who can stand against us if our God is for us neither height nor depth neither height nor depth can separate us hell and death will not defeat us he who gave his son to free us holds me in his love neither height nor depth can separate us hell and death will not defeat us he who gave his son to free us holds me in his love sing with joy now our God for us the father's love is a strong and mighty fortress raise your voice now no love is greater who can stand against us if our god is for us sing with joy now our god is for us the father's love is a strong and mighty fortress raise your voice now no love is greater can stand against us if our God is for us. Well, amen. Let's have a time of fellowship. Would you turn to someone? Maybe tell them that God is for them this morning. Let's have a time of fellowship. seats as we continue to worship together. His mercy was revealed. 
what mercy was revealed what selflessness and peace my fate was surely sealed until he rescued me his pardon for my sin his bounty for my need from slavery and shame i am redeemed and heaven can't contain the glory of the sun jesus is the christ the saving one his love has made darkness steal my joy for blood has been poured out the enemy destroyed death could not hold him down the cross was not enough to steal away his love for he is God and heaven can't contain the glory of the sun Jesus is the Christ, the saving one. His love has made a way, the grave is overcome. Jesus is the Christ, the saving one. And anyone who calls upon his name, church you may be seated that is my prayer for this morning that when we leave today that every one of us in this room will have called upon the name of Jesus amen good morning, good morning. beautiful day beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord beautiful day to be inside period <laughs> but uh, um, it's an important week Valentine's Day is coming up and uh, I don't know about y'all, but, uh, you know, my wife uses Valentine's Day to look back on the past 365 days and, you know, just realize how blessed she is. <laughs> and then she's got the next 365 days to look forward to. But, no, I'm the one that's blessed. Um, I have a beautiful bride, and um, you're number one. <laughs> but uh, I do love her. We, we got to go out and... Uh, Friday, uh, Saturday was the, no, Friday, Friday was the end of deer season, so we got to go out, I didn't have to work, we went to Longhorn, and did y'all know they have buffalo horns in Longhorns? That's the inside joke between me and Haley, 
I'm not gonna, I told her I wouldn't embarrass her no more than I already have. But uh, um, Valentine Banquet's here at the church coming up. Um, we look forward to seeing all of y'all. The youth are going get to get to have a chance to serve you. Um, they're even going to take your plates from your table when you're done and throw them in the trash. I told them, I'm going work, to work y'all. We're going to have a good time. But uh, I think, thank you for all that signed up for that. Um, on Wednesday nights, we've been going through uh, different steps of who we are in Christ our security in Christ, our confidence in Christ, our stability in Christ, and this Wednesday night, I asked them a question, who are you? Who are you? And as, as we discovered, we're not very much. Not very much at all. I'm not very much. You're not very much. But Christ that sent us, that's who we are. That's who I want people to see. I want them to look right through me. And see Christ standing behind me. When you look at Brother Sam, you should look right over the top of him. And see Christ standing there. Oh, that was a good one. All right. Let's pray and we'll take up our offering. Father, I love you so much. Uh, Lord, I just uh, I thank you for a time, Lord, of just fellowship and, uh, and laughter. Father, you give us our sense of humor. You give us all the good things that we have. The Word tells us that all good things come from you. Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the good things that you've blessed us with, Lord. And now as, it, as, it, as it's the time to give back a small amount of that, Lord, I just pray that we're diligent with us, with it, Lord. I just pray that you lead us on in these worship services today, Lord. Be with our speaker. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in his life and his family's life. Lord, we love you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful stand with this as we continue to sing.
beautiful name. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Have thine own way. God, that that would be true in our lives, Lord, that more and more that Christ would be seen when people look upon our lives. God, as we sang earlier in this service, Lord, that anyone who calls upon the name would be saved, God, I pray. God, I'm thankful. Lord, I thank you, God, for the salvation that you have provided for the majority of the people in this room. But Lord, there are still some who need to call upon your name. And so, Lord, I pray that you have used this time of worship, Lord, uh, that your, stir is, your spirit is stirred in hearts in this room already. And, Lord, I pray that you would continue to move and stir. Lord, I pray that you would stir uh, the hearts of the children as they are taught in children's church. Well, thank you for Brother Caleb and his opportunity to come and share with us this morning uh, what you are doing uh, outside of our country, God. Just uh, may we see uh, just a picture of your, of your grace, Lord, that's not just here. Lord, that it's everywhere. It's in the whole world, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray as you are being worshipped throughout this, this country, throughout this, this world, Lord, as people are be, being saved, as people are turning from sin and, and falling at your face all across this world this morning, God, I pray that that would take place here as well. And, Lord, that you would use Brother Caleb and, and the message he has for us and use the power of your spirit to draw more to you Lord, that we would rejoice in the salvation of many. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yes. 
little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Everywhere I go I'm gonna let it shine Everywhere I go I'm gonna let it shine Everywhere Can you hear me? We're good? All right. I was worried that I would go to the bathroom and you might hear things with the mic on. <laughs> Our church is much smaller than this. There's about 20 of us. You saw the, the shot of us there. A um, very small community in a place that's quite large compared to um, Geneva and Enterprise. Um, so we're going to be doing Bible drills this morning. Um, I've prepared what I would say is a sermonette for a Christianette, but... I might get long-winded, so forgive me. It might turn into a real sermon. but um, um, Okay, so we're going to start in Lamentations 3, if you have your Bibles. Turn with me there. Um, so about, oh, I guess it was about early January, we decided that we would come kind of last minute to the state. So we made this little dash that we're at now for six weeks. And um, right when we decided to come, Ashley woke up one morning early, um, and she started journaling. And um, 2023 started out to be quite difficult for us. Um, every day was, um, and it comes to my slides, just kind of click through when you hear me say certain things, or I can tell you to go to the next one. But um, 2023 uh, started out quite difficult. Every day, like from January 1 until about the 8th or even on past that, we were getting some pretty, we had some events happen, some news, bad news. Um, long story short, uh, it was, we were very discouraged <laughs> starting out 2023. Um, and then so she actually woke up one morning, she was journaling, and she wrote down the good, the bad, the worst. And, and at the end of the day, we looked at the grace of God that he had bestowed in our family over the past four and a half years. And the overall theme was God is great in his faithfulness. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, is his faithfulness to, um, to us as believers, to the church, um, all over the world, into our little not-so-important family living in Romania. And so, um, Lamentations 3, 22, verse 23, says, it's on the screen as well if you can't get there fast enough, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And so, what is faithfulness? Faithfulness is steadfastness, it is firmness or fidelity, and it's good to know what isn't faithfulness. So the opposite of faithfulness um, is ever-changing, wishy-washy, or enmity. 
And so that's according to the, the Webster's Dictionary. And enmity was the one that kind of struck me as I was preparing this because enmity is what we are without Christ. We are at enmity with God. We are enemies to God. And he is actually even opposed to us. But through Christ, through Christ's sacrifice, through his grace, through his love, through faith in Christ, we are now called children, sons and daughters of the king. And so if faithfulness means steadfastness, firmness, and fidelity, and the opposite is wishy-washy, ever-changing against, um, uh, it's important for us to remember who God is, um, especially when things don't go the way you want them to, especially when day after day, negative news constantly. Um, so turn with me to Psalm 119. Like I said, we're doing Bible drills, so halfway, about halfway in the Bible. I go to Psalm 119. You should probably know this one. It says, your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. So here we see that faithfulness is equated with God's word um, in Psalm 119. God speaks never-ending, never-changing truth. If he spoke something a thousand years ago, it still stands. He is faithful to his word because his word is an expression of his character, reflects who he is. The promises he made still hold true because he does not change. And if, he is a reflection, if his word is a reflection of him, then it does not change either. That's Malachi 3.6. We don't have to turn there. Um, so we see this illustrated from a human perspective in a couple married for many years. And um, let's say that the wife gets cancer, she gets Alzheimer's, she's dying on her bed, and the husband stays with her, sits with her by her bedside. They've been married for many years, and even though she doesn't recognize him, he doesn't leave her. He is, he is faithful to the promises he made to his spouse, to his wife. And in 2 Timothy 2.13, in the same way, God remains faithful to his promises, even though we are often unfaithful to him. I don't know about you this morning, but me, many times, I'm, I'd rather live at, uh, be, to be living in disobedience to God rather than listen to his will. And so even though that we don't remain faithful to him, he still remains. So we learn to trust the character of a person by getting to know that person, right? You get to know your wife before she's your wife or your husband before he's your husband by getting to know them. You can't just marry some stranger. Just the way I wouldn't walk into the bank in downtown Enterprise or Geneva and just give my money to some stranger. I don't know them. I can't trust them with my funds, right? We have no experience with them. We don't go to the post office and just hand our bank account information to a stranger, right? We don't know their character. Before we knew God... We are afraid to trust him. But once we know God, we start to, we start to trust him. And um, we don't know yet who he is as, as a new believer, perhaps, or what he may do. And so as a new believers, um, we need to learn to trust God by getting to know his character. Where do you find his character? I've already answered the question. God is who he says he is, and it's spoken to us through his, the word, the Bible. And that's where we get to know God. There are three ways we get to know God. And then we can see his faithfulness, and it's through studying his word or knowing his word. It's through remembering his deeds, his actions, who he is, who he says he is, his promises, and then following his voice. And so um, today what I want to try to do is take this truth from God's word about his faithfulness to us as believers, to, to us as his people, and kind of connect it to the last four and a half years since my family has been to the United States. I think last time we were here as a whole family was back in 2018, I think, um, four years ago. And um, we were with my wife's, uh, we were with a different mission organization, my wife's organization, and we were living um, and doing work with them. And then you might have gotten an email if you signed up to our newsletter a few months later in 2019 that God had called us to move <laughs> six hours away from Ashley's parents and her sister and brother and our cousins for our kids and to move to a place we didn't know. And so um, <clears throat> through knowing his word, so as we're going to jump into this, sorry real quick, I'm getting, I didn't change my page. Forgive me. Still a little tired from jet lag. Um, so 
our church, we planted a church, like it said in the video, in 2020, right after the pandemic just opened up for a little window for us in, in the fall of, or the late summer of 2020 to where we could meet uh, in small groups. And so we started the Village Church. And our church's mission is to know Jesus and to make him known. And the reason why we want to make Jesus, to know Jesus and make him known is because that's what discipleship is, what it means to be a disciple of Christ, what it means to be a follower, follower of Jesus, is to know him and to make him known. And so as our family, that's our, that's our family's mission, to know Jesus um, and to make him known. And it's our church's mission as well. And the reason why it's important in Romania, and maybe it's important here for us to consider um, the, our lives, our Christian lives, um, as knowing Jesus and making him known, is because in, in Romania, the Orthodox people don't know Jesus the way I know Jesus, the way you know Jesus. They know who he is. They know he's the Son of God. They know he is the third person of the Trinity. They know that he was born. They know that he died on the cross. They know that he raised three days later. We'll be back. Um, our trip this year is short because we'll get back um, just before Easter because Easter is a huge, huge holiday in Romania. And so they know Jesus. And if I would walk on the street in our city, anywhere in Romania, and ask them, who is Jesus? And they would tell you, 98% of them will tell you that Jesus is the Son of God. He died for our sins. And um, he's the third person of the Trinity. They affirm all those things. But there's a difference between knowing and knowing. Maybe you Gen Zers might know the, if you know, you know, little text thing, right? A little younger generation might know that. Everybody like 35, like myself, is like, what are you talking about? But if you know, you know, right? And so the question is, what makes the difference between a Romanian that would affirm the things that I've just said and the things that we believe, but also we would consider them lost, not knowing Christ? How can I say that 99.5% of the people in our town of over 200,000, or cities, sorry, of 200,000 people don't know Jesus. And it's because what I believe about God is the way that I will live. If you want to judge the way you're walking with God, if you're walking in his will, look at your actions, because they're going to tell you what you believe. So if you believe that Jesus is the king, that he's going to be the Lord of your life. If you believe that we should love the poor and share the gospel, then we're going to be doing those things. If we believe God is who he says he is, then our lives will be a reflection of those. Our life will be given to doing his will. And so, that's how we know. We look at their fruit. They live day by day in the fact that they know that Jesus is who he is. They're going to celebrate him in a few weeks at Easter and kill a lamb and cook and eat and have a great time. But they have no clue who he really is. And so our church exists to know Jesus and to make him known. Um, <clears throat> and sadly, as the generations go on and as social media gets uh, bigger and controls more of our lives and as America um, kind of like sets the tone for what the world does in terms of society, um, we're a little bit further behind in America in a lot of things. Um, looking at the news is quite depressing sometimes, uh, as you all well know. But um, Romania is not far behind America. I would say we're more conservative there um, in general. But the younger generations are even more disconnected from who Jesus is because they, their parents no longer go to the Orthodox Church. They're just Orthodox because they're Romanian. They don't, it doesn't make any sense to them. They're not Christian because they know Jesus. And so we know God by studying his word. When we study God's word, a pattern emerges. Okay? In Numbers and in 1 Samuel, we learn that God never changes and he never lies. We learn that scripture, that God has never... In Isaiah, we learn that God has never failed in the past. Everything he sets out to do, he does. He, always, he, is, he, was, he is always true to his word, and he has worked in the lives of the ancient Israelites. When, we, when he said he would do something, he did it. We see this in Numbers eleven twenty three 23, and Matthew 24, 35. We begin to build trust upon his proven character. When we're in the word, we know the word, and we're studying the word, we start to know who God is. And that's how we know he is faithful. We begin to build trust upon his proving character throughout the years. We can trust that God will be true to himself because that's who he says he is. He never changes. He will never cease acting like God. He will never cease being sovereign, being holy, or being good. That's 1 Timothy 6, 15, 1 Peter 1, 16. And we even learn through our own history 
but he has never failed us either. Um, one command God gave the Israelites was to remember. In Deuteronomy 8, 2, and Isaiah 46, 9, he says, remember. And when they remembered all God had done for them, they could more easily trust him for the future. And like I said, 2023 started out to be quite difficult for us. Um, maybe this isn't very difficult to you, but we lost six chickens one day. Very difficult for us. It's kind of trivial. One day, our landlord kid said, we finally found a house that we, we live in that's very affordable, really nice. It's the first home that our kids and wife said, wow, this feels like home. He came to tell us on one day that his son has made some bad decisions with finances and they need to sell the house. So I don't know what we're coming back home to. The other day, I don't even know, I think our greenhouse decided to fly across the thing. Again, it's small things, but it just all added up, right? And so it was a very difficult start to the year. And I was like, really? This is like 2020. Like, can we just stop and redo? Like, I don't want this to be the way it's going to be. Ashley was driven to write it all down. I woke up a little later, um, got my coffee, and she goes, sit down and listen to this. She began to read, and hopefully um, at the very end of my little sermonette, it's probably turning into more a sermon, but she will come and share a little bit from her, her uh, remembering of what God has done for our family. So Philippians 4.19 says that he provides what we need. We say that, we believe that, but do we actually live that way, right? He will always make everything work together for our good when we trust in him, Romans 8, 28. So we learn through studying God's word, through knowing it, that our past, present, and future is in him. We learn to trust his faithfulness by remembering his past faithfulness. So um, we learn and experience God's character through our own stories, um, writing down. That's why it's good to journal. If you haven't, just sit down and write down how God's been good to you. If you've had a bad day, your chickens get killed by your dog, and your greenhouse flies away, and you oh, my car got ran into by a crazy driver. Just like, you know, when those days happen, stop and write down and remember because your perspective changes. So God's will for our life in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, is three things. Uh, he wants us to pray continually, rejoice always, and be thankful. Um, God gave the Israelites, as I said, all the festivals and the feasts, the Passover, the... Um, uh, I can't remember what it is in English, uh, the festival of the, of the tents, all the different things they did, he gave it to them for a reason. It wasn't just because tradition, and we should just have tradition for tradition's sake. He wanted them to remember his promises that he made to Abraham, to Adam, to um, Noah, to all uh, the people of God. He made promises, and he wanted them to remember them. That is why we as Christians have the Lord's Supper, and we participate that in frequently. We participate in that to remember what Christ has done for us on the cross. So God's will for our lives is pretty simple. It's for everyone. It's across the board. To rejoice, to pray continually, and to be thankful. Because when you're not thankful, the chicken house fly, or the greenhouse and the chickens dying begins to become really overwhelming, and you're in despair, at least for me. Maybe I'm more dramatic than others, but it was a rough day. <laughs> So Christ gave us the Lord's Supper to remember his sacrifice. The gospel message is what we're remembering when we take a part in the Lord's Supper. The gospel message should be fresh upon our lips, upon our hearts, upon our minds. Every day, moment by moment, we should be remembering the gospel. Unfortunately, I think that we, we consider the gospel to be the ABC of Christianity rather than the A to Z of Christianity. The gospel is what got me out of bed this morning. The gospel is what brought us to church. The gospel is what's going to get me through when my dog kills the other six chickens, probably before I get back. But the gospel is where we start, and it's where we continue, it's where we stand today, and it's where we're gonna, it's going to get us through to tomorrow. And like I said, um, I'm not sure what's next on the slide, sorry. Um, so remembering God's faithfulness to our family just kind of get a little personal with you, as I've shared a little bit already. And Asha will share a little bit more about that because she's a better storyteller than I am. And she doesn't forget the important parts. And so I do want to give you an overview real quick um, of why we chose to go to Pitesht. Uh, you saw in the video, if you um, weren't getting your kids out of the, uh, the room, you saw that there was, um, it was really simple for us. I'm not a mathematician. I don't like math. My wife taught math. Um, but it's, it was a numbers game. Just simply a numbers game. There's over 200,000 people in our city. 
There's about 700 Christians, and there's seven gospel center churches. And so if you do the math, I'm going to round things out for you guys. It's easy. So you see 200,000, 700 Christians, seven churches, one to 28,000, one church for every 20,000 people. And that's one gospel-believing church, right, like we're in today. So let's imagine Geneva County for a second. Or, or Enterprise. Enterprise has about 29,395, according to the 2021, what I found on Google. Um, Geneva County has about like 26,000, I think, the whole county. That's like this, this building, this church, being the only church for the entire county. There are over 150 churches that I counted um, in Geneva County, probably more, probably less, I don't really know. Um, but that's one church. So there's 26,701 people in Geneva County, 151 churches. That's one church for every 177 people. But where we live, it's like imagining the entire county, Geneva County or Enterprise and having only one gospel church, just for some perspective. So to us, it was a numbers game. That's why we came to Pitesh. That is why we chose to plant a church there. We left a place where there was one church for every 8,000 people. Still not very good statistics, right? Every village that we, in the county that we lived in um, before moving in 2019, every village had at least one church, and the majority of them had at least two gospel-believing churches in the village. And when, we, uh, were, when God led us to Pitesh through some different things, different circumstances, we were studying, and we found there was over 500 localities, like townships and cities and villages, and there's only 40 churches in the entire county, and there's over 500,000 people that live there. And so that's like one church per, I don't want to do the math, I'm not good at it. But that is why we chose Pitesh. And when we chose Pitesh, God was faithful to us, and we found the perfect home. Three floors, three floors, plus a basement. Sounds huge, because it was, right? It was perfect for us as a family going to Pitesh, not knowing a single soul there. And we had zero contacts. We were pioneers, as it, as it would be in a missionary life. We'd be called pioneers. Going there with no contacts, knowing no one. But we felt that God was calling us there, and we found the perfect home. We put all of our funds, like every bit of our salary, everything we had in the bank at Contact Mission, our mission organization, we put in six months' rent. It was an extraordinary price for this. As a trial, kind of like the fleece with the water. Lord, you're going to be with us? You're going to be faithful? Or are you going to leave us out to dry? Well, we were able to do, because the house had an apartment, and then it had another apartment above us, and we were able to rent that out through the Airbnb. And Airbnb was what helped us supplement our, our, our salaries, help us pay the rent. We stayed there for about a year and a half. He, God provided us community. He provided us money for our rent more than we needed through Airbnb, um, and we were able to have a friend. You see this picture there, uh, Andre and Ani. They are a, uh, he's a better preacher than I am, better man than I am in many ways, but he's a co-planter with us. He planted the village church with us. His family has been so good for us. We have community. They've been encouraging to us, and just hearing God's faithfulness through his story, through his family's story of him growing up in communism. He's 43 or 42 years old. His parents and grandparents were persecuted under the communist regime. They were moved out of their house. Everything was sold, and they were put near the river in a very, very poor uh, place in a small home with another family that happened to be Christians, and they were stuck there, forced to work. And they were given rations for their food, and they weren't allowed to go to the store and buy extra bread or extra whatever they could get. They had what they had, and if it didn't make ends meet, sorry. Many times it didn't. But listening to his stories of his grandfather, who, was a, um, who before he was moved away was a priest, and then he became a believer through knowing God's word, through reading it, because they're not encouraged in Romania to read the word. And many times as Americans, we're lazy and we barely open it. And so through reading God's word, he came to know Christ. His grandfather then became a pastor, and his uncles actually helped translate the Bible in Romania in Romanian language. And so they were persecuted for that. And just listening to that reminded me of how God is faithful. And they've been a blessing to us ever since we moved there in 2019, a source of friendship. And they helped us plant the church, as I said, in the fall of 2020. And so kind of jumping back into my sermon, we can also learn to trust God 
by learning to distinguish his voice from the others that compete for attention. And there are many voices out there. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And so um, we who belong to Jesus need to cultivate the ability to hear him. And how do we hear him if we don't read his word? He doesn't speak through visions and dreams necessarily. He doesn't speak through loud voices. He can. He speaks through his word primarily. And we need to have the ability to hear him. He can also speak through other people, through circumstances, through the inner confirmation of the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, 16. And as we carefully read, study, and meditate scripture, the Holy Spirit will quicken our hearts many times to a verse or a passage and help us apply it to our current situation, struggle, or sin problem. So whether, it's convert, whether you're reading the scripture and you're learning about Christ and it's encouraging or convicting, the Holy Spirit shows us in his word that his word is to be taken as faithful and true. He shows us that in his word he is faithful and his message is true. So we, we also build the trust by remembering his promises and applying them to our lives. And above all things, I think God desires for us to demonstrate faith. Hebrews eleven sixteen 16, faith in him as a new believer, as, a, as an unbeliever coming to know Christ, yes, but also faith to continue in the battle that we call life. Faith is trusting the character of God before we see how he is going to work things out. Going to Pitesh was insanity. I don't know. I look back and I said, why? Why did we do this? Why? Because I still don't know. But looking back over Ash's journal, with all the good, the bad, the worst, you can see God's grace and his goodness to us. So um, God has given us his word. He's given us his promises. They still stand today. So let that be an encouragement to you today as it is to me. Um, as we see the way he brings his promises to fil- fulfillment in our own lives, in our church, in our communities, in our country, our trust in his faithfulness should grow. Just as our trust in other people grows as we have daily interaction with them, with our spouses, with our children, with our parents, as we grow alongside them and get to know them, we can trust them too. So we trust him when we know him, and to know him is to trust him. So when we know him, we can rest in his goodness. We can rest in his goodness to us when our chickens are dying and our greenhouses are flying and our cars are being ran over by terrible drivers and all the bad things that can happen, big or small, we can rest in his goodness. Even when we don't understand the circumstances that seem to contradict his goodness, and I think 2020 was a rough time for everyone, Um, and we can trust his plan will prevail, Proverbs 19, 21. And as a child trusts his loving father, we can trust our heavenly father to always do what is right. Because God, when we ask for bread, is not going to give us a snake. He's a good father, and he always and only can give what is good to us. And that means chickens dying is good for me. My greenhouse flying away is good for me. My car getting ran over is good for me. I don't understand it. It's frustrating, but it's good for me because God, our heavenly father, can only give what is good and what is right. He has been faithful to me. I know he's been faithful to you and to your church. Your church, El Bethel, has been an instrument of God's goodness and faithfulness to our family and to the people of Pitesht and to our little church and even to Ukraine. Um, Ash will share about that in a minute. And that was all through prayer and sacrificial giving. And we want to say thank you for sticking with us through the mid-season change for the craziness that we decided to do four years ago. And we're thankful that we're allowed to come back and share that with you. And that's all we want to do is to encourage you to Remember God's faithfulness. Remember his goodness. Because he's, he, he can only be faithful to who he says he is. And so we have to trust that. We have to know God. We have to remember him. Rejoice always. Pray continually. And be thankful. Thankfulness will change your day. Trust me. So um, after, I'm going to ask my wife to come up and share a little bit of stories of the past four years. Um, and then before you guys leave, make sure to stop by our table and get the prayer card for us, it's a new one. Um, also, we have two keychains. You can take both if you want. They just say, pray for Romania, and they have our camp our camp logo because we actually will share with you a little bit about that. Um, but then after she gets done, I think, Sam, are you coming? He's going to come up and close us out. So thank you for listening to me, and enjoy, Ashley. Do you need this? Okay. Okay. All right, I'll go quick because... 
I know American churches go faster. Um, can you uh, turn to the next slide? Um, thank you guys for having us so much. It's so different to be in the Lord's house and sing songs in English. And it's good to be with our children here. So I just want to say thank you for that. Um, t t the COVID lockdown was extremely difficult. We were like under very strict lockdown. We weren't allowed out of our house for over two months. And when we went to the grocery store, only one person was allowed at a time. So like me or Caleb would go and we would had to write a pass where we were going and we would get military checks along the way. So um, it was extremely difficult to meet people during that time. We had a mandatory mask law inside and outside of buildings. Um, up until the war with Ukraine, Actually, the day that the war happened, uh, we had a huge amount of Ukrainian refugees come to our border, and then the laws for COVID just went out the window, and we had freedom and could go and talk to people and meet in groups, because before the laws were six people at a time in your home, and when you have four kids and two adults, that's six people, so we couldn't even have like people over for dinner. So it was a little bit difficult when they did let the laws loosen some, we would do as much activities as we could. Um, but in 2021, when we were sitting there and wondering about COVID and like, are we wasting our time here? We're not really meeting with people. Um, there was a lady from Spain who had five acres of land and she didn't have any children and she wanted to donate her land to another mission organization. And Caleb and I were approached with the opportunity to take the land and we were like, yeah, um, we'll pray about it and maybe we'll do like some American fall festivals and like Easter egg hunts and use it for our church. And um, they thought it was a good idea so they gave us a piece of property. And to give you an idea of how huge of a blessing this was, um, the property itself is worth $300,000. So for us, we were like blown away that it was just a gift. Um, we had to pay for the pool uh, because they had it in a loan. So we ended up paying like $10,000, but in the grand scheme of things, like you get a huge piece of property. And then America recently during that time pulled out of Afghanistan. And I was watching on the news, I was like, Caleb, if I could, I would go there and help, but I know it wouldn't be any help. But if that ever happens again or something where we can help, I want to help. And then when the refugee crisis came, I was watching the news and I was like, we have to do something. Maybe God has given us this property so we can do a camp. So on the next slide, I think I have some pictures of the camp. Yeah. Um, on the bottom right, it didn't snow at all until the day we decided that we needed to renovate the camp. And then it started snowing every day for the next month as we were trying to set up and bring the containers in. As you saw in the video, we just had like literal containers and they were just being plopped on the ground and we would put bunk beds in there for the people. Um, I guess the hardest, it was emotionally exhausting because people came from war. Um, one family, in Ukraine, they like blocked off for children, or uh, for adults, men. If they had less than three children, they weren't allowed to leave Ukraine. But if they had more than three or more, then they could leave. Um, one family had five children, and they were in the heavy bombing area on the Russian border. And their children sat in a bomb shelter, in a bunker for, was it three weeks? Three months. Three, no, it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, three months. Okay. Three months. And then um, they finally got enough courage to leave because at the time they were like shooting Ukrainians as they were trying to leave the area and stuff. So they finally worked up the courage to leave. And um, along the way, there were like 40 checkpoints. And at one of the checkpoints, it was a Russian one, they would not allow the father to leave. So he was forced to stay there. And their children came to us. They traveled like I don't know, 30 hours or something to get to us because they heard about our camp. And the first night that they spent the night, they got in really late in the night. Our friend actually drove them from the border to our house and spent the night with us. And um, it was a big ordeal, but they woke up in the, Romania, the sun comes up around four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so the kids woke up with the sun on them and they're like, what's this? And they forgot about the sunlight. And they're like, it's so beautiful just to see the sun. And just like 
I don't know. There are so many stories of the heartbreak. And I guess the other, the hardest times was like people suffered strokes. We had two strokes um, from our refugees. Um, I had to tell a lady that she had pancreatic cancer and um, that she didn't have a chance at living. Um, it was just like so emotionally difficult. Um, but now our refugees are, we've helped a lot of people come and go. And some of them chose to stay in Romania. Some of them chose to go on to Spain or Italy, a couple to America and Canada. So we just helped them make their papers and get them wherever they wanted to go because the borders were open to them. And the ones that chose to stay, um, we found them housing. We still help them with translations. Um, and that's what we're doing right now. So since we had a break, we decided that now's a good time to come to America and just say hello. And thank you guys so much for your support um, over the years for us. Thank you for praying for us. Um, it's been nothing short of spiritual warfare. Um, but I also know that God's doing a great work for it through us and our church. So thank you. One more slide. I'm sorry. <laughs> you guys are like our first church, so <laughs> um, the future plans. <laughs> you can see uh, the black gate. I'm trying to be like Magnolia Farms. <laughs> I get my inspiration from America. <laughs> um, so that's their property. You can see the containers in the back. We hope to move them to the back of the property eventually, but right now they are stuck where they are in case there's a nuclear attack or something where we need to open back up the camp again. Um, so we're just leaving them right now, and our future plans are to build like a barn dominium um, center where we can meet as a church and have discipleships and programs with the city. So, all right, thank you. All right, let's stand together. We will have a time of invitation. If nothing else, we've learned of a lot of things that we can pray for learned of a lot of needs. We've also learned more about their ministry. I think it's wonderful when missionaries can be able to come back and spend a little bit of time, and we know them personally. I think that's one of the uh, difficulties of Southern Baptist. Sometimes we have we support a lot of missionaries, but we really don't know them by name, and we're not able to uh, see more individually and personally about their work. So I think it's a wonderful time. So uh, we will open this up. You can come and pray. You can come pray for them. Be thankful. And if you're here and you've never trusted in the Lord, please do that today. We heard a lot of good things about God's faithfulness. He is faithful, and he will get us from where we are now to where we need to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time. Help us during this time of invitation, Lord, that we will um, do business as we should with you. Thank you for the things that we've heard already. In your name we pray. Amen. Shall it? 